Last time, I built this curved front floating desk for my new closet office, but as you can see, it's still vacant. That's because I'm still in my old closet studio. Why? Well, I needed to address a few issues first, starting with storage and organization, and then the big one. We're gonna have to get rid of this echo. So I dialed up some acoustic panels that left me perplexed, some curved shelves with copper cummerbunds, a custom desk organizer with flip-up seats, and some awesome box joint drawer organizers that had me questioning if I should sell all my tools and just buy a laser. Now because of the amount of work that was going to be involved, I first wanted to get going on the curved floating walnut shelves. And I wanted to do these kind of Jory Brigham inspired style with walnut and orange to add a pop of color and some visual interest. But I also wanted to add a little texture to it. So my plan was to take two pieces of walnut, put a bevel on them, and then sandwich a piece of Baltic birch plywood in between and have the orange color semi-transparent so you could actually see the plies of the Baltic birch in between. It sounded like a feasible plan aside from the lining up of the plywood layer with the two top layers since the bevel had to line up perfectly with the edge of the plywood. And I knew if I could pull it off, it should look pretty cool. So after milling up some eight quarter walnut flat and square, I headed over to the bandsaw to resaw it down to just above five eighths of an inch and then ran them all through the thickness planer to get them exactly five eighths. And then I could start gluing up the walnut panels since each shelf would require a top and a bottom. That makes eight total panels. So some glue, some clamps, could put those aside and let those dry. And while that was happening, I headed over to my buddy Pete's at Petrie's workshop, where his laser was kind enough to cut out me two separate templates. As we discussed earlier, the middle plywood layer is a little bit smaller than the outer walnut layer. So it required two templates, a big and a less big. And then back at my shop, I could rip these panels to width, but had to kick Lola out at first. And as you can see, she was a little reluctant to leave as she sat there hovering while I ripped these boards down. And of course she had to find her way back in at some point. And there she goes. Now with all these panels ripped to width, I could rough out the basic shape of the curve at the miter saw just to eliminate a bunch of that material and get as close to my layout line as possible before heading to the router table for flush trimming. I did the same thing with the plywood layers, and then I could take my two individual templates. I'm starting with the plywood layer. You can see I labeled each template, and then just using this up cut, down cut compression bit from bits and bits, I made quick work of those plywood layers. And then for the walnut layers, I decided to double them up since I have enough cutting height here, and then just followed suit using the same process following that template with the bearing, and ultimately ending up with eight identical walnut pieces and four identical pieces of birch plywood. Now to make those plywood layers visible through the orange color, Total boat, baby. I'm using some Total Boat high performance epoxy and some orange pigment dispersion at just the right amount so it gives me a little bit of opacity or transparency, and then I just painted it on. And as you can see, those plywood layers are showing through nicely. So once that colored epoxy was slathered on evenly, I set that aside to cure over night. Now to put the bevel on the plywood layers of the shelves, this is not a regular chamfering bit. This is, I believe, a 30 degree beveling bit. That way it's a little shallower and a little more subtle. Oh, Shopcat Jerry coming in for a correction. It's 22 and a half degrees. Okay, now that all of our walnut shelf parts are shaped and profiled on the router table, we can move on to sanding. Now, many people don't realize that sanding and surface preparation are the most important parts of getting a professional looking finish on all of your projects. So if you rush through, you can end up with sanding swirls or pigtails, scratches, or even an uneven surface. So it can essentially make or break a project. Now, having high quality sandpaper like this 3M Pro Grade Precision Sanding Sheets that is durable and won't clog will help you sand faster and give you better results. And I love the no slip grip durable backing because it essentially sticks to itself, which helps reduce tearing and hand fatigue. They also make these sanding sponges in various grits that are much easier to hold on to in your hand and maintain even pressure across the work surface. Now in all my years of sanding, I've yet to find a sandpaper that not only cuts as quickly as the 3M Pro Grade Professional Sanding Sheets, making it my top choice for sanding all materials from wood to metal to plastic or drywall. Now it comes in these one third sheet packs. I like to get the big boy, the 20 pack of nine by 11, because then these can be cut into quarters and put on sanding blocks 
or they can all be folded in half and in half again, giving you four brand new fresh sanding surfaces with every sheet. Now let me show you a quick little tip on how I fold this. Now I first start by folding it in half and making that crease, then unfolding it, folding it in the other direction, increasing that. So now I have quadrants, but I don't wanna fold this in half and then on top of each other, because then you have grit on grit rubbing and that will wear out very quickly and you will completely eliminate the advantage of the no-slip grip durable backing, which is a little tacky. So what I do after I fold it into fourths is I make one slice here with the utility knife, and now I can fold one over, fold this over, and then fold this over. So now at no point in this little sandwich do I have grit rubbing on grip. Now, since this piece of plywood is going to be sandwiched in between these two pieces of walnut, the inside surface isn't really critical. But I do want to sand this down and make sure I get any glue squeeze out from when I glue these panels up, because glue doesn't stick to glue. So I'll get a nice clean surface on those two inside faces, and then I can turn my attention to these profiles. But these profiles, I need to get these before I glue up. So as you can see here, there is a little fuzz left behind by the router bit as well as some lines from the bearing itself. So we wanna make sure we clean all those up, get this nice and smooth in both directions. So using a combination of regular sandpaper and some sanding sponges, we're gonna get that nice and smooth. Make no mistake folks, end grain is never easy to sand. You have to go slowly and just keep following that grain to get rid of any scratches and keep the scratch pattern consistent with the direction of the grain. Now we can move on to sanding the inside faces of all these shelves. I'm gonna use the 3M Cubitron, 150 grit here. Just give it a quick once over. Again, it's not really important on the inside. Jerry, you're interrupting the video. <laughs> so now that all the epoxy is dry, I have come to the conclusion that I don't want to go with the orange. And then I realized I had made this headphone stand which has some nice copper rings and copper pins. So I'm going to incorporate this combination into this. And how am I going to do that? Copper gilding. So the epoxy isn't a total loss. This is actually a good thing because what that did was fill in all the voids and cracks and perfectly smoothed out this plywood edge. So now I'm gonna use 180 on this. I'm just gonna break the gloss off of this epoxy here. And then I can apply some gilding adhesive and start the copper gilding. Once those edges were all cleaned up, then I could clean up the faces where that epoxy had kind of spilled over. So with the orbital sander and some 150 grit, I was able to get those surfaces nice and tidy. Then I could apply the gilding adhesive to all those plywood edges. While that adhesive dries, I'm just gonna cut some strips out of this leaf. Stuff is very delicate. So there's my leaf paper backing. Give it a nice burnish. It's just a gilding brush. Not too bad. Now, since I was anticipating a lot of glue squeeze out when clamping up these shelves, I coated that end grain with some shellac, which would make it easier to wipe off. And to assemble, I'm using some 23 gauge brad nails here just to secure that plywood layer in place so it didn't slide all around. Then with some clamping calls and some clamps and a lot more squeeze out than I thought. Could wipe it all away. And phase one of two of the first shelf is done. Then on to phase two, spread some glue and then put on the outer walnut breading. All right, only three more to go. All right, let's talk turkey. Even though I went through the trouble ahead of time of pre-finishing these edges with shellac because I knew there was going to be glue squeeze out, because there was so much and after the first glue up I was wiping it away and wiping it away after the second glue up, wiping that away, it has really damaged this copper leaf. It's scratched, there's some gouges, it even rubbed off in some places. I don't like it. So rather than spending all the labor and time to glue up the other three, we're going to plan B.
And what's plan B, you might ask? Well, as you can see, I grabbed some more walnut, but this time I'm going with solid material, no glue ups, just going to try to keep these as simple as possible. I did, however, need a new template because I changed the size of the shelves as well. Thanks again to Pete at Petrie's Workshop for cutting this lickety split on his laser. Now this is a slot cutting bit. Unfortunately, where the bearing is, it will cut too deep of a slot than I want. I wanna go just shy of an eighth of an inch deep. So I created this zero clearance fence, made one pass, and without changing any settings, I flipped the shelf over and made another pass, giving me a 3 eighths of an inch groove centered perfectly on the thickness of my stock. Now I'm going to try a new method when hanging these shelves. A buddy of mine, Stan at Level Home Improvements, turned me on to this. It's using one by one aluminum L channel, as you can see here. So I need to cut a recess or groove on the back side of each shelf, as well as a slot for the actual channel to slide into, which I'll do on the table saw. Unfortunately, both the groove and the slot of the table saw needed to be stop cuts on one side, so that was fun. And once all those were cut, I could actually cut the aluminum channel just on the miter saw to length. And rather than spend all the time squaring up that arched groove left by the blade on the table saw, I'm just gonna cut this aluminum channel at the metal band saw, which makes quick work of this aluminum. And then I could pre-drill all my mounting holes for when I attach these channels to the wall. After the holes were drilled, I countersunk all the holes. That way the screw heads would be nice and flush and not impede with the shelf sliding on. Then using some two and a half inch screws, I could get all these mounted to the wall, making sure they're perfectly level and in alignment with each other. And then I could do one final test fit of the shelves. Now I did have to scribe these a little bit. I'm not gonna walk you through that whole process. This time, since the walls weren't out that bad, it was pretty negligible. Then I just needed to do a little bit of profiling on these shelves. I decided on a quarter inch round over on the top. I know that looks like an eighth of an inch because it is, but I went back and did a quarter inch. And then it was all about cleaning up the end grain and all the milling marks and saw marks. Then I grabbed some Total Boat Fixo Epoxy and my 1 8 by 3 8 copper bar. Now in retrospect, I think this 3 8 bar is too wide. I should have gone with a quarter inch or maybe even 1 8 of an inch wide just to give it a more subtle detail. That 3 8 wide is kind of in your face. So a little Monday morning quarterbacking on that one. But there was no way I was doing these over again. And once all four shells were dried overnight, then I could sand the copper. Now as you can see, I'm putting some tape down. I was finding when I was using a sanding block, I was kind of tilting a little bit and it was scuffing up the end grain of those shelves. So with some double layered tape, that prevented all that. So I just used some sanding sponges, some 220 and 320 grit sandpaper, then some steel wool, took that tape off and it was time for finish. I'm using Rubio Mono Coat in Walnut here. So I'm just using a white Scotch-Brite pad to work it all into the surface. And once it was thoroughly coated and no dry spots were shining through, then I let that set for a few minutes, could wipe off all the excess and set those aside to cure. And there they are. Still not over the moon with how they look, but I'm over it. Now to secure these shelves to that one by one aluminum channel, I'm just going to install some quarter inch long, quarter 20 set screws underneath. This should be more than sufficient holding power to make sure those shelves don't slide around. Especially when Jerry and Lola decide to jump up there and make it their napping place. Once those were dry enough, it was time to get these beasts of burden hung up on the wall and in the rear view mirror. Well, even though they're gonna be in my front view, pretty much all the time staring at my desk. I wanted to get these things out of the shop and up on the wall and just be done with them. Sometimes you just work on something so long, have so many problems that you just want to be done with it. Now in the past, all of my workstations have been IMAX, which are basically a big monitor with a computer built right into it. So I just built a monitor stand, then I could set the IMAX on top of that and have storage underneath. But my setup now is a little different. I have a Mac Studio, which is basically a big hard drive, and then the monitors are separate. So I needed to build an organizer that could house all my hard drives, but also allow easy access behind for cable management. So I actually spent quite a bit of time building all these little cardboard models of the exact size of my hard drives and my computer and my accessories, and then built the organizer around it. 
and I decided to mimic the curve that is actually on the front apron of this desk into the organizer itself. I did this with the help of the Shaper Origin. I also used the Shaper Origin to cut these little grooves and slots that will allow cables to come through for my phone chargers, etc. Now all the dividers of the organizer need to be the same height. So I set up a stop block on my little sled here, cut those all to the correct width, and while Jerry snuggled in for a nap, I got set up to do some template routing. Now since the top lids of the desktop organizer are curved, well, the shelves have to be curved too. So I created a quick template with the Shaper Origin, double-sided taped my piece to it, rough trimmed it at the bandsaw, and then headed over to the router table for the flush trimming operation. Now this entire organizer is made out of 5 8 thick material. And since there's no actual bottom, and it's all made out of 5 8 thick material, joinery, well, was a bit of a challenge. So I decided to join all the horizontal shelves to the vertical dividers using tongue and groove joinery. And since I didn't want to see that groove on the front face of the dividers, they all had to be stopped dados. Now there's two ways you can do this. You can either round off the tongue or square off the groove. I decided to round off the tongue, it's a little easier. And then the test fit. What do you think there, Jerry boy? Now one little accessory that needed a special holder is this Evo preamp, which plugs into my mic. So I cut a couple delicious bevels on the bandsaw, and I'm just using some CA glue for a quick grip, that way I don't have to clamp this thing. Aw, oh, sleepy Lola. Just a little tip here on roundovers to get you the best possible looking grain. So I need to do a 9 16 roundover on this. So if I go on here like this, which I want to, you can see that you have straight grain showing along that roundover. If I were to round over here, that would end up being flat sawn grain right there, and it would essentially look like this. Instead, it'll look like this, nice straight grain. Now this roundover is actually going on the two end pieces of this desktop organizer. And there's actual multiple operations that need to happen at the router table. The first was the roundover, and the second is a little 1 8 of an inch rabbit at the top. This is going to create a nice shadow line. And notice the nice straight grain that we talked about before. All right, so after that work to create this nice little cradle here, totally forgot to take into account that the cable comes up from the top, sticks out here, so when the top would come across, it would hit that. So, get rid of that, and welcome 2.0, which is at a 45 degree angle. Now when we put that in there, the top goes on, everything clears, and the cables can run behind unfettered. Now the back of the little divider shelves needed a cutout for cable management. So I did a little template with the Shaper Origin and then over to the router table. Now with all of my dividers and end pieces glued up, I then laid out for what's going to be... Oh, what are you doing? Can I help you, sir? Always has to have his paws in everything. As I was saying, what is going to be the support stretcher that connects all the dividers together since there's no bottom. The shelves will give it some integrity, but not enough. So using a template, I cut a perfectly aligned recess in all of the pieces, squared the corners, and then as you can see, this is how that support stretcher will fit in there. And I obviously didn't go all the way through the two end pieces because that would look weird. Now to cut a little recess finger pull in the middle section. So by properly aligning the center mark on my piece and on the little jig that I made, that ensures that the groove or the finger pull or under bevel, under round over is in the middle. Now once that was all done and all my pieces were sanded, then I could apply the finish. I'm using Rubio Mono Coat in Castle Brown or maybe Walnut. One or the other, doesn't really matter. It's a hard wax oil, wipe it on, wipe it off. And the next day I could start gluing everything together. I'm using some Total Boat Fixo Epoxy here. As you can see, I did mask off the areas where this little angled holder divider thing goes so I would get good glue adhesion. Got that in the clamps, and then I could just sequentially glue this whole thing up with the dividers and the shelves. Now you may be asking, why did you pre-finish all the parts and then glue it up? Well, since all these parts are so small and there's so many interior corners, it was just easier to pre-finish the parts individually. Right, Jerry? Oh, you finally agree with me on something? Now once all my dividers and shelves were glued up, then I could glue in the stretcher to tie everything together. Well, at least the front of it. The back was another issue. All right, so I have all my sub-assemblies glued up. 
And now I need to glue this strip across the back, which I made a pretty big mistake is not really factoring any joinery there. So all of this is already finished, so glue is not gonna stick. So I have two options. I can scrape off all the finish here and on here and glue this down. I could nail it. Well, what about figure eight fasteners? Figure eight fasteners it is. I gotta say this worked out kind of well. It was easy and fast and solid. I, I don't even know what's going on here. Now, rather than have the bottom of all the wooden dividers sit directly on the desk, I wanted to add a little cushion. I didn't want wood on wood. So I got some of this cork rubber, which had absolutely horrendous self-adhesive backing. So I peeled that off and then used this fast cap speed tape, which is ultra strong and had no issue holding that crubber in place. Hinge selection. Well, I decided to use sauce hinges and it's great because the shape of origin has the files for the cutouts right in the library. You can just download them right to your machine and look at that, a perfect fit. I decided to go with black ones because I thought that worked well with the walnut. So once I got all those cut with the shape of origin, everything in and screwed down. But before I got the lids attached to the organizer, I had one thing left to do and that was to cut a recess for my little maker medallion here made by Medallion Maker Branding. There's a link below if you wanna get some of these made for yourself, fits in there perfectly. And then I could attach all the lids now, one of the most important parts of using these hinges, especially in this application across that long back strip and across three separate lids is layout. Layout is so key, otherwise nothing will line up. So always take your time with layout. Now, before we move this into the office and get everything set up, we have a couple of other things to do first, starting with addressing that horrendous echo you heard in the opening with some acoustic paneling. Now there's a lot of options for these out there. And I looked at three different ones before making my decision. The first two were posh wood and the wood veneer hub. Now these are very similar. They're strips of MDF with a wood veneer on them and they are stapled to a quarter inch felt backing. Now the only thing that annoyed me about those was the wood veneer was unfinished. So I would have to finish all of that and hope I didn't drip anything on the black felt. Now I ended up going with 3D wall decor panels, and I'll tell you why in a minute. First, I needed to get a little creative with the baseboard. Since these panels aren't attached directly to the wall, they have to be attached to horizontal sleepers that are attached to studs, everything gets built out a little bit. So if I were to put these down the wall and sit them on top of baseboard, they would just overhang. So I made my own extra deep white oak baseboard using some white oak and some plywood strips on the back, then coated everything with shellac just to seal it. And since I had made that extra thick baseboard, the adjacent baseboards needed to be trimmed. So using an oscillating tool and a scrap cut off, I trimmed that off. That would allow that baseboard to slide in there. Now, these are the panels I chose, which were from Wall Decor 3D. They come in packs of two. that are eight feet tall by one foot wide each. Now, the reason I went with these is they are actually solid wood, but the biggest advantage is they are pre-finished. Now, there were a few disadvantages, which we'll get to in a minute, According to Jerry, the packaging was actually a home run. Now, the biggest disadvantage of these is the wood quality. As you can see, a ton of wood filler, some nasty tear out. I guess it gives it a kind of a rustic look. You know, and all three of the brands I looked at were relatively the same price. I needed six panels for this wall. It cost me $858. Was it worth it? I don't know. Probably not, but I don't know. I do like the look, but that's a lot of money to pay for a look. I guess the real value will be determined after we do an echo test. Now, after I got all my furring strips installed on the wall, the baseboard in, I could then start trimming all my panels, which actually trimmed really easy with a track saw. I mean, it's just wood and felt. But before we install any of the acoustic paneling, let's do a baseline echo test. I have to use the bathroom, but it's occupied. Now that that's established, we could start installing our panels. Now I cut these just a hair long so I could flex them into place. After making sure the first one was plumb, it was all about some 23 gauge pin nails. I put some tape across just to prevent any marring. I did not want to fill these holes because those pin nails leave such a tiny hole you really can't see. I mean, and listen, the quality of that wood, it blends right in. Now I did have one obstacle to contend with and that was an outlet, but luckily that felt cuts away pretty easy. So I just made sure to double and triple check the location of the cutout, did my layout lines, and then used a utility knife to cut away the foam, a jigsaw to cut away the wood. 
and then I could fit it in place. And then I ran into this problem. And that's the fact that this outlet would have visible wires looking down in through that panel. So I got a box extender. I also bought a black outlet and a black faceplate cover just so that would blend in nicely with the black felt. I didn't want that bright white on there. So once I got that installed, then I could just keep moving on down the line. And when I got to the last piece, I needed to rip this down to width at the table saw and I really lucked out here. I only had to cut the felt. It just so happened that the exact width of a strip fit perfectly. So then I could just pop that in place, finish it off with a few pin nails and wait for the inspector. And there he is. And here's the finished wall. I might add a trim piece on top. I'm not sure yet. Now, one other thing I built was the window trim for this. I'm not gonna go over that. It's just a basic window casing with extension jams, a frame, a sill, an apron, and I just secured it with some brad nails. Now, to hang my monitors on the wall, these are what I am using. Now, my new monitors are a VESA mount, so you need special mounting brackets to hang them on the wall. Now, the reason I bought these particular ones is they give you a ton of height adjustment with those little notches in the brackets. And there's also tilt adjustment forward and backward and left and right. And once those were installed, I could start moving in, starting with my Mac Studio, getting all the cords run for that, and then a bevy of other accessories, my hard drives, mic, etc. And once the cords were all run, then one of the most satisfying parts is peeling off these protective layers on the monitors and then firing this bad boy up. Now, before I could get too comfortable in this new setup, I needed to head back over to my buddy Pete's at Petrie's Workshop to laser cut some drawer organizers for me. Wanted something very custom, so I brought over the Walnut Milltown to about 5 30 seconds of an inch, and then using some weird online software, is able to enter tray sizes, and the computer automatically calculated the box joint size and spacing. And then he cut these absolutely perfect looking box joints that didn't even need glue. Now, I've been woodworking for decades, always trying to keep up with technology and new tools, but now with just a few keystrokes and a laser beam, I have stacks of perfectly fitting boxes in minutes. Now, does this scare the heck out of me as a woodworker? Not really, because what these machines do is produce things that I don't want to make on my own. My time is much better spent on things like design, material selection, complex joinery, etc. And that's one reason why I outsource drawer boxes for cabinets. I don't want to make them. And if you do the math, all the labor involved, it's a complete loss. What do you guys think? Does technology like this scare you? Is it watering down the craft? Are we all going to be replaced by robots? I think it's definitely becoming a hot topic and deserves more discussion down the road. But in the meantime, I'm just going to admire these perfectly fitting box joint organizers and have no regrets. And now with everything done and moved in, it was time to revisit our echo test and see if the acoustic paneling did what it was supposed to. I have to use the bathroom, but it's occupied. I have to use the bathroom, but it's occupied. Okay, so the lighting in here is bad. I got an overhead light, it's dark outside, but the sound, that echo is gone. I mean, these are doing the job. Now, it would probably be better if they were in front of me rather than behind me. That way my voice was projecting into them and being absorbed, but I'm pretty happy. I mean, was it worth $858 and the labor to put them up? There's probably cheaper options that would work just as well, but I do like the aesthetic of this. I like the vertical slats with the black felt in between. Do like that it's a contrast with all the walnut that's going on in here. So I'll let you be the judge. I don't regret the purchase. How about that? I do not regret it. So that's about a wrap on this one. Still have some miscellaneous things to do. I'm sure Jerry and Lola want some cat beds in there. Maybe something on the wall, maybe some LED lighting on the back wall. But for now, this one's done. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks to 3M for sponsoring this video. And we'll see you on the next one.